presented by Alex McDonald. So before we're just going to go through some housekeeping. So um, if at any time during the presentation tonight your questions box disappears, you can click on the red arrow to get it back. Uh, this red arrow, sorry, this red arrow up here. And if you want to ask the presenter questions, you simply need to type your question into the questions pane and press send. Alex will stop a couple of times in tonight's webinar to uh, take questions. Um, if you're having any audio problems, you can call in using your telephone. So to do that, you need to switch your audio from mic and speaker up here to telephone and then dial in using the number provided. So with that, I'll hand over to Alex for tonight's webinar. Uh, thank you, Katrina. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, Melbourne Cup Eve. Um, we're going to... Uh, talk about collecting avatar carcass information for breed flan. Uh, as uh, Katrina said, this is the fifth of uh, six webinars um, and uh, there will be another one next week. So I thought what we would do for a start off is just talk about what are the traits that can be collected and where they get collected and by whom. So. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware of the ultrasound scan technology which uh, allows one of the accredited assessors to be able to measure eye muscle area, P8 or rump fat, rib fat and intramuscular fat uh, on live animals. Um, so they are the four traits that, that can be collected and reported um, uh, by, from ultrasound scanning. Oops. I think we've missed it. I know, here we go. So uh, the other traits uh, um, are the carcass traits which come from abattoirs um, and we'll talk about them in more detail uh, um, as we go through. So why is carcass data important? And by that I mean why is abattoir carcass data important or carcass data in general? Um, as you're well aware, our current payment system is based on several carcass traits, uh, namely carcass weight, fat depth, marbling in some cases, and uh, also eating quality um, as uh, described by MSA. Uh, premiums are sometimes available for carcasses with higher uh, MSA indexes, not always, but uh, I think we're going to see more of that, and you'd also be aware that the the factors that uh, influence MSA index uh, include oss ossification and marbling. Uh, the, another reason why carcass information is important is that uh, in uh, for some markets, just simple higher osmeat marbling scores are, um, attract premiums, and a good example of that's a Wagyu breed, where um, each additional uh, each additional marble score is worth uh, about a dollar a kilo. Uh, and we've been talking about it for a long time, but there may be uh, sometime in the future premiums and disc discounts based on a measurement uh, of retail beef field. Now, the abattoir carcass traits are these. Um, carcass weight and P8 fat which are normally measured routinely by the abattoir on the kill floor um, or recorded uh, electronically on push pads, etc. Uh, and then a number of traits that um, are normally recorded by an MSA grader assuming the carcass is graded. Uh, not always, but sometimes uh, rib fat is measured by the MSA grader uh, to make sure that they meet the minimum. Eye muscle area is not a requirement of um, the MSA index, but sometimes MS grader, MSA graders will measure eye muscle area. But uh, I'll talk a little bit later about how reliable that may or may not be. Um, it's routine for the MSA grader to uh, measure pH, to measure ossification, which is, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, um, uh, a measurement or a score of uh, ossification of the bone structure which is really describing the physiological age of the carcass rather than using something like dentition. 
meat colour is standard, fat colour is standard, and uh, either the Oz meat or, or in the case of MSA graders, they will use what's called an MSA marble score, which does have equivalent Oz meat marbling scores. So the first two traits are normally collected in the normal uh, kill because uh, um, payment is based on those. Um, and then in addition to that, assuming the carcasses are graded by an MSA grader, there's a, a number of other traits which can be measured and collected. And then uh, more applying to uh, research data, but um, or also uh, for the bin projects, uh, there are some laboratory tests. There's a mechanical shear force test which measures tenderness, uh, uh, chemical fat, IMF percent, which is measured in, can be measured in the laboratory. Um, pH, as I've said, can also be measured in laboratory and meat colour. Now, to get those measurements, it requires a meat sample to be taken um, from each carcass uh, the day after it's slaughtered. Now, let's just look at uh, the, the carcass traits which have EBVs and what data is used to calculate those EBVs. So first of all, carcass weight EBV. Um, if carcass weight is available on the animal, then of course it's used. Um, but in most cases, the carcass weight EBV is calculated from the correlated weight traits of 600 and 400 day weight. Eye muscle area, uh, again, can be uh, is calculated first of all, if carcass EMA is available, it will be used, but in, in the majority of cases, what would be available is a scan, ultrasound scan EMA. Um, those two traits are used to do calculate the eye muscle area EBV. Same applies to rib fat depth. Um, if the carcass data is available, then it's used, but alternately um, scan rib fat is used, ultrasound scan, P8 the same. Retail beef yield, in uh, very few, exper in some experiments, um, carcasses have actually been boned out to calculate the percentage of saleable beef uh, from the carcass, um, but that's quite expensive to do, quite difficult to organise. So in the vast majority of cases, um, the retail beef yield is calculated from the correlation between eye muscle area, where larger eye muscle areas you expect um, higher retail beef yield, that's the EMA EBV, and, and fat depth EBV, so that the higher the fat depth, then the lower the retail beef yield. The IMF percent EBV is calculated from carcass IMF percent if it's available, but alternately um, scan IMF percent. And uh, the Wagyu breed has an EBV for marble score, the Osmeet marble score, and that's, uh, that's calculated from um, the actual Osmeet marble score that's taken on those carcasses. I thought I would just demonstrate to you the variation that can occur or does occur due to genetics. In other words, everything else is, is equal in terms of uh, treatment of those cattle prior to slaughter. And I've used as an, as an example cohort two from the Angus progeny test or benchmarking program. Uh, in, in cohort two, there were 47 sires represented. They had between three and 21 steer progeny, most of them having somewhere around about uh, 10 or 12 progeny. So it was giving a pretty fair um, uh, representation of the, of the genetics imp imparted by that sire. I've taken the highest and lowest uh, for each of these traits. I, I could have just compared the five highest with the five lowest. The differences wouldn't be quite as great, but I can assure you they're still very large. So if we just look at a, um, a trait like eye muscle area, um, which has been adjusted for um, uh, adjusted for age, where there's variation in age, has been adjusted for um, age of dam, etc. But after all those adjustments are done, there was a range, and these are sire groups we're talking about. The sire groups or progeny groups range from 76.1 to 95.6 square centimetres, or a 
0.5 square centimetre variation. Now, all these bulls were all joined randomly to females, so uh, we would assume that the effect of the dam in all cases is um, equal across all sires, so we're looking at sire effects. P8 fat range from 15.4 to 25.4 millimetres, that's a 10 millimetre um, variation, which is quite large. Rib fat um, proportionally similar, 12.1 to 18.16 millimetres. MSA marble score um, range from the, for the sire with the progeny group uh, with the lowest marble score, 395.6, and that's equivalent to uh, an Osmeet score of 2. Um, remembering these cattle have been on feed for 250 days, so we certainly would expect them to be showing significant marbling. Um, the group representing the highest sire was 656 in round figures, uh, equivalent to an Osmeet score of 4.5. So the, the progeny of the lowest sire averaged marble score 2, and the progeny of the highest sire averaged marble score 4.5, so that's uh, about a 2.5 variation. Um, that's large. Uh, and carcass weight, um, 469.1 for the highest, 410 for the lowest, um, almost a 60 kilo variation. And in today's carcass prices, um, those, that variation can represent a lot of dollars. So if we just took carcass weight, for example, um, I don't know what the price of these uh, bodies is, but I suspect they're somewhere up around 8 or $9 a kilo, um, given the, the, the uh, feed time they've been on feed. Um, so if we took 60 kilos at $9, that's $540 difference in the value of the carcass of the uh, carcasses from the from the highest scoring sire to the lowest. Um, depending on the price grid, uh, an Osmeet score could be worth 50 to 70 dollars. So uh, again, Oz, the um, marble score variation of two and a half could be very significant in terms of value of those carcasses. Um, not so much going to uh, influence EMA and P8, unless of course they're what they were being paid on yield. Um, but if yield uh, predictions and payment did occur, you can see that there could be a very large variation in yield of these animals as well, which is, as I say, purely driven by um, uh, sire effects or genetic effects. So just to, to look uh, again to make that point at this same cohort of uh, Angus in their progeny test. Um, and what I should say is this, this cohort's not unique. If you looked at cohort 3, which has full data available, you would see almost identical um, range in values. And yeah, I'm sure if you looked at the Hereford bin or, or one of the other bins, you would see the same sort of thing. So if we just look at the variation in indexes, and this variation is after all the carcass data has been um, entered and analysed in breed plan, uh, the sires, the 47 sires, varied from 152 the best to 54 the worst, 98 nearly $100 um, uh, variation in index, and the index reflects the, the difference in economic value per cow join. So, put that $100 and $98 over um, 30 or 40 calves uh, per year, that's you know 4,000 a year and so on. Domestic index, not quite as big a range there, $64. Grain fed index, huge range, $152. And the grass fed index, not so much. So carcass data is really important if we want to be able to accurately evaluate sires in terms of their influence on the value of their progeny. Um, I've just put this slide up because um, one of the aims of the um, information nucleus programs or progeny test programs was to try and identify what we might call super sires or, or, or um, 
uh, very high ranking size. Um, and I've just put this up because when I was looking at the Angus results for cohort three, um, the best performing sire was the sire NURG20. Uh, he uh, now has, once his progeny were all evaluated, he is the highest indexing sire for grain fed index um, for uh, all of the published Angus sires, imported and Australian. And he's right up the top in the other indexes as well, the breeding index at 171, domestic index 139, way above breed average. Again, just demonstrating, I don't think that sire would have been quite so high or identified as so superior without the actual carcass data being um, put in there. Scanning had him on the right track, but uh, it was the carcass data that got him right to the top. Um, and again, I've just looked at, shown you why this sire is such a high indexing sire. Um, He's way above breed average for carcass weight. He's way above eye muscle area for, uh, sorry, breed average for eye muscle area. Um, he's uh, well below breed average for rib fat uh, and P8 fat. Um, his predicted retail beef yield, given those previous figures, is um, um, well above breed average and the same with IMF percent. So. He's a bit of a unique sire in that normally we expect uh, IMF percent and EMA or, B, or retail beef yield to be antagonistic, so you'll get one that's a high yield. The expectation is that high yielding sires don't always marble all that well and high IMF sires don't always yield that well. So again, by having very good carcass data, we found a sire that, that does both very well. Now, um, as I've inferred, carcass data does provide higher accuracy EBVs and ultrasound measurements. Um, um, ultrasound scanning is, and to explain that, ultrasound scanning is used to measure carcass traits in live animals, in seed stock herds, which is why it's so valuable. Uh, um, and then those measurements are used to calculate scanned carcass EBVs. So the actual scanned carcass EBVs are calculated. And then the scanned carcass EBVs are used to predict the differences in carcass measurements of slaughtered progeny. Um, now, it's not the scanned carcass EBVs uh, do not have a, a correlation of one with actual carcass EBVs. Um, um, they actually have a correlation sitting around about 0.6. So they're very good predictors, but um, as I'll show you in the next slide, they they're not quite as uh, valuable in, well, you'll never get the same accuracy from scan uh, data as you will from carcass data. So I'll just talk you through this slide. It's comparing the accuracy of, let's say, um, an eye muscle area EBV uh, or a marbling EBV for that matter, when you only have scan data comparing to, which is the dotted line, uh, compared to uh, if you actually have direct avatar carcass data. So what that shows is that um, even with a lot of scan progeny, the accuracy of those EBVs is never going to get up above 60%. And that's, uh, that's because the correlation is not one. However, with actual carcass data, you can get accuracy sitting up around 80% with uh, maybe only you know 15 or 20 progeny. So it, it just demonstrates that in terms of the influence of, on the actual carcass EBV, uh, uh, actual carcass data is uh, more valuable than scan data. However, having said that, Ultrasound scanning is still has a very important role. So, uh, firstly, it can be used to measure carcass traits in seed stock at a relatively young age, and obviously that's an advantage because we don't want to have to uh, slaughter seed stock to get carcass data. You can get good carcass data on a on a whole set of of uh, heifers or sale bulls um, using ultrasound scanning at a relatively early age. Now, 
as we know, um, sc ultrasound scanning can provide carcass measurements on the progeny of thousands of sires in any one year, whereas um, because of the um, cost and uh, difficulty of doing a full-blown progeny test, uh, even Angus are uh, only measuring about 40 sires per year. So um, ultrasound scanning is very important uh, because it can cover a much greater range of sires. And uh, with modern um, carcass trimming hide puller activity in most abattoirs, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that you will always get more accurate measurements of fat depth uh, from an ultrasound scanner than you will from abattoir measurements. And as I say, that's due to hide puller and, and, and trimming damage that's done to the carcass before you get to measure the fat depth. Um, in terms of eye muscle area, it's it can be the same, particularly with the the um, the, the modern trend to um, uh, treat carcasses, which I'll talk about in a moment. I've, the term's got out of my mind, but um, the, the eye muscle area can get very misshapen uh, as part of the abattoir process. So um, scanning is very important in terms of getting measurements of eye muscle area. And of course, the costs of uh, scanning are minimal compared to the cost of running a progeny test. Spencer rolling is the term I was trying to think of, and I'll, t I'll tell you what that is when we get to it. Okay, so uh, I'm going to just break for questions. That's all been fairly introductory, but Katrina, if there are any questions, I'll endeavour to answer. Yep, um, we've got one so far, and if anyone else has got any more questions at the moment, send them through. So the first question is, what happens to the EBBs if the carcass EMA is submitted sometime after the scan EMA? Okay, that's a good question. So uh, breed plan will first of all calculate, and if we think about these, uh, um, the progeny tests and, and um, the Angus for example, the, the scan information comes in first early on. Uh, after the first 80 or 90 days on feed, um, that's analysed and you will get um, EBVs based purely on the scan information and the um, pedigree. And then once the carcass data comes in, it tends to take over from the scan data. Um, the scan data is still used, but because uh, it's a direct measurement of the trait that we're getting an EBV for, um, once you get about half a dozen carcass records in there and good contemporary groups, it will take over from the scan data. Thanks, Alex. Uh, the next question we've got is um, one about submitting abattoir data to breed plants. So the question is, we generally send four to six animals to a local butcher's abattoir. They are usually in one or two contemporary groups. Um, if we get the relevant information from this abattoir, are we able to submit it to breed plan? Um, yes, you are. Um, as I'll, I'll talk about uh, in the next part of my uh, presentation, um, we do need to know some information to make sure that they are in uh, contemporary groups, but obviously that questioner understands the importance of contemporary groups. So yes, um, ideally if they were in uh, if, there were, if the contemporary groups were three steers or three heifers, um, because heifers would be analysed differently to, have to steers. Uh, so that was the last question. Okay, let's press on. So uh, this, um, to some degree, uh, covers the the second question we had. So ideally, uh, carcass information is collected from a structured progeny test program. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, uh, we generally have similar numbers of progeny from each sire, uh, and we have a very and we have very good control over the uh, contemporary groups, and we certainly have control over the um, date of slaughter. So that's, that's, there's no question that the 
that the most valuable data comes from a structured progeny test. Uh, there needs to be appropriate measurement collection protocols, uh, in particularly in the abattoirs. Um, we'll talk about that, but it doesn't just uh, roll off on a computer at the end of the kill. You need to be sure that a whole lot of things have happened properly in that in that abattoir. It is important that animals have been reared together and treated the same way, and have not been what we call harvested. So. To give you an example of that, um, and we'll use the progeny test as an example, um, it's normal for um, a feedlotter or a processor um, with a yard of 180 or 200 um, animals in the one feed yard that he doesn't just slaughter them all on the same day. They'll usually go in and, and pull out the group that have hit the required um, carcass weight. Um, and appear to have, have adequate fat, etc. And the problem with harvesting is that it's not, it's usually not across all size, evenly across all size. So you may get all of the progeny of one sire pulled out in the first group and only one or none of uh, the progeny of another sire. And so what that means is because kill date is part of the contemporary group, that um, that sire that actually had the fastest growing progeny in that group um, only ever gets compared, or his progeny only get paired, compared with one or two of the fastest growing of, a, of another sire, and they don't get the credit they deserve because they're, they're all average or close to average. Whereas if you slaughter the whole pen together, then the sires that are going to have the heaviest carcasses um, uh, get rewarded and the sires that uh, have the lightest carcasses uh, don't get rewarded. But the important thing is that they're all fed for the same length of time and they're all killed on the same day. Now harvesting can of course occur in a grass fed situation as well. Um, and what I've said there, and maybe this goes a little bit across what I just said to the, to the questioner, uh, if you're a stud and you're just killing you know, a few cull steers or a few cull heifers, um, that data is really not very useful because, again, uh, the number of cull, the culls don't necessarily equally represent all sires. So you can get biases if you're just using cull steers or cull heifers. Now, it would be great if we could get lots of carcass data from commercial slaughters, in other words, other than progeny test programs. But there's a few requirements we need. So uh, they must be a valid contemporary group, and that includes not being twins. Being born a twin is going to uh, always be a bit of a disadvantage uh, in terms particularly of weight gain. They start lighter and, and invariably may not catch up. Uh, um, even at weaning, they're obviously going to be a lot lighter and they may, ne may never catch up. So twins uh, have to be taken out of the contemporary group, identified and taken out. Uh, they can be their own contemporary group. Uh, these cattle must have been reared together and treated the way, same way during background and finishing. So you can't have a situation where for some reason um, some of the cattle got onto grain earlier than others or or just got a better a better paddock of grass, etc. So for a contemporary group, they must all have been reared, backgrounded, and finished together. And as I've commented earlier on, they they must not be harvested from the feedlot or the or the uh, grass finished mob. So for commercial, what we call commercial slaughter data to be valuable, it has to meet all those all those requirements. We also need to know approximate birth dates of the animals, and approximate means probably within a couple of weeks, um, because clearly, you know, a birth date variation of two or three months can have a significant uh, effect on the ultimate carcass weight, on the ultimate fat depth, etc. So, uh, if we know the approximate birth dates, then breed plan can make the suitable adjustments. But if there are no birth dates, um, then that data is not very useful. We need to know the sire of each animal. Um, ideally that can be recorded on farm, but um, 
it can be done with DNA parentage. There's, uh, you would need to take a meat sample or a blood sample prior to slaughter um, and send it off for a parentage verification. Cost about $25 per animal. Um, sires need to be randomly mated. Uh, in other words, it's not fair if one sire um, uh, is only used over heifers and the other sires are only used over cows, which would be a normal, a normal management practice. Um, but you can see that could really disadvantage the sire that was used over heifers only. Uh, and if there's uh, you know, more than one breed in the cow mobs, um, it's important that the sires are randomly mated. So it's starting to sound like a progeny test and in many ways you've got to have the same requirements. Uh, and of course you have to have more than one sire represent in each, in each with reasonable numbers of progeny. So again, back to that second question, if all those carcasses or all those animals were by the same sire, uh, we can still use the data but it doesn't give us any information about sires because we've got nothing to, we don't have any way of comparing sires if, if they're all progeny are by the one sire. Um, now in terms of collecting data, it, it, it sounds quite basic, but um, uh, abattoirs run on your NLIS tag RFIDs, um, all their reports run off those RFID numbers, um, which are within the abattoir, they're correlated usually with a kill number in the abattoir, but uh, it's very unusual that they will actually read ear tags. So if you've been using visual ear tags to record things like birth dates and weights, 200 and 400 day weights on the breeding property, it's really important that you cross-reference those the, the visual tag with the RFID before the animals leave the property. Um, it can be done in the abattoir by standing at the knocking box and doing the cross-reference with the kill number, but I'd recommend that it's done prior to the animals leaving the property. Now, as I've said, we need to, um, ideally there is going to be a representative uh, of the cattle owner um, present at carcass measurement. Um, doesn't providing the RFID is correlated with the, um, with the visual tag prior to leaving property, don't have to be there uh, on slaughter day, but it's certainly important that someone's there on um, the day that the carcasses are measured. So the things that are important are that the carcasses are all quartered at the same site. Um, that's usually going to be the 10, 12th rib, 10, 11 rib or the 12th, 13th rib. Um, but sometimes abattoirs, be, based on weight, some will get, some will get um, quartered at 10, 11 and some will get quartered at 12, 13. Um, on the MSA feedback sheets I've seen, they do record the um, quartering site, which is important. Uh, you need to check um, what sort of level of fat stripping has occurred during the slaughter um, um, due to hide pullers. And if there's significant fat stripping, um, it, it means you've got to be ultra careful doing rib fat measurements or you might not you might even use the rib fat measurements, which I think is probably the most likely outcome. Um, and the term I was talking about was Spencer rolling. Um, it's quite, a lot of modern abattoirs now, on the hot carcass, they run their knife down the backbone so that the eye muscle area falls away from the, the backbone. And when you uh, go to measure eye muscle area the next day uh, in the chiller, um, it's pretty difficult. I mean, it can be done, but my experience is you're never going to be as accurate measuring Spencer rolled carcasses as you are um, carcasses that are not Spencer rolled. If you're on good terms with the abattoir, they may agree not to Spencer roll them um, because they know you're going to be doing carcass measurements. Um, and also you would need to be there if you need meat samples. So um, that would always happen in a progeny test. Now, I've mentioned MSA grading uh, several times and I talked earlier about the, the measurements that the MSA graders make, which are important. Um, so if at all possible cattle should be slaughtered at an MSA accredited abattoir, um, you should not assume that uh, every carcass is going to be um, graded by the MSA grader. Um, in some abattoirs it may occur, in others it may not. So 
you would need to make a prior arrangement to ensure that the carcasses were going to be graded by the MSA grader. Um, your abattoir feed, your standard abattoir feedback sheets will include carcass weight and P8 measurements. Now, depending on the abattoir, these can be and often are cross-referenced with the MSA graders um, uh, data, so you can get uh, uh, on the one sheet, you will get both the carcass weight P8 and then you will get the MSA scores on the same sheet. But um, you need to double check and you may need to get two reports, one the standard kill sheet, which is what your price is based on, and the other one is the MSA grading report. So um, a little bit more about processing of carcass issues. Um, most abattoirs electrically stimulate, um, so it is important that all carcasses are treated the, the same. Um, in other words, the stimulator doesn't break down halfway through the kill uh, because that will have an effect on the tenderness. Um, I've talked about fat trimming with wizard, wizard knives and uh, hide pullers. Um, carcass damage, normally, again, it will be noted on the kill sheet. If bruising is severe, it obviously, and they've taken cut out large lumps, then obviously that can affect carcass weight, so any bruised animal may need to be excluded from the data. Um, talked about quarter site, all need to be at the same site. Spencer rolling we've talked about, and uh, MSA grader measurements of EMA uh, are generally not reliable, and I say that because uh, EMA is not part of the MSA index, so in many cases, the graders are, particularly if they're grading online, which is, is becoming more common, uh, they just haven't got time to do an accurate measurement of EMA. They'll have a guess at it or an estimate. So my strong advice is do not rely on the MSA grader to provide you with accurate eye muscle areas. If you want eye muscle areas, someone independent's going to have to go in and do that in the abattoir. Submission of data. Animals must be recorded on the breed database before you can submit carcass data. So they need to be recorded with whatever pedigree is known. It may only be sire. Um, they need that approximate birth date and they ideally need their uh, NLIS RFID, the electronic number in the NLIS tag. Um, to submit data, you need to use a, a standard Microsoft Excel template available from BreedPlan. Um, you need to have a good look at the data that shows that it's normal range of results and decimal points are in the right place. Sounds simple, but um, we do get, have had data in here that with decimal points in the wrong place. Um, traits current, currently analysed in breed plan are carcass weight, P8 fat, eye muscle area, Osmeet marble score, IMF percent and retail beef field, which I've mentioned. But we would encourage you that if, if the data is available on other traits such as pH, meat colour, ossification and MSA index that that's already submitted. Um, I think it's unlikely we'll have an EBV for meat colour or ossification or, or pH, but we may have an EBV for MSA index in the future. So let me just summarise. Carcass traits have a large influence influence on the profitability of a breeding enterprise, and you'll remember those Angus examples I gave you. Carcass traits are strongly influenced by genetics, again shown by that example. Um, abattoir carcass data is very valuable in being able to calculate accurate, high accuracy EBVs for carcass traits. Ultrasound scanning of seed stock animals, especially heifers, provides important data for calculation also. The most valuable carcass data comes from structured prodigy tests, but um, if carefully managed, we can get useful data from commercial slaughter data. MSA grading provides measurements on a number of carcass traits, which we talked about, um, so please always have your carcasses MSA graded if possible. Um, but for carcass data from commercial slaughter animals to be valuable genet for genetic evaluation, um, we need to know a lot about the background of those animals to make sure we do have valid contemporary groups. 
and as we've said, carcass data should be submitted, submitted electronically in a standard format available by from ABRI or breed plan. So that's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions, Katrina. Yep. Um, so I've had a couple of questions come through. So the first question is, uh, in a commercial ACR herd, do we need to have a reference sire? Uh, good question. So ACR being uh, an Angus term for their commercial register, um, ideally you would have a reference sire um, which probably A needs to be an AI sire, one or two AI sires. Um, however, if you didn't have reference sires, um, it would still do a very good job of ranking the sires within your herd. But ideally, yes, use a reference sire which would be a, you know, a widely used AI sire, one or two. Thanks, Alex. Um, this question's in a couple of bits. So can a ratio table of correlated fat depth slash EMA to carcass weight on individual carcasses not be formulated within breeds to negate having to use contemporary groups? Each individual's data could be compared to the table and be ranked higher or lower. Would negate harvesting problems and would allow EMA rankings given at a standard fat depth and relative to carcass weight. Um, and then the next bit says, not used to create carcass weight figures, but more to create EMA figures relative to weight and condition. Okay, I'll see how I go. Um, the, the first thing is that um, eye muscle area uh, and fat depth, uh, the EBVs are calculated at a standardised carcass weight. So um, we need the carcass weights of the animals. We need the measurements of eye muscle area and fat depth uh, to be able to actually calculate the EBVs because they're eye muscle area at a given carcass weight. Um, that carcass weight is normally uh, 300 kilos, but for the Angus breed, it's, it's 400 kilos. Now, the reason we can't just use an index is that um, breed plan must have, it, it, it cannot work unless it's got contemporary groups, i.e. Um, the only way it can take out environmental effects is by analysing animals within contemporary groups where the environment has been the same. So even if we used um, um, index, which what you're talking about is um, uh, phenotypic indexes of of the ratio of of weight, sorry, of eye muscle area to weight. Um, yes, a pre plan would would not be able to analyse that data. It it, it it would be it may be useful. Um, I mean, it's the sort of data we use in a carcass competition, of course, where animals go into a carcass competition from a whole range of um, in, environmental backgrounds. They might come, you know, in 100 carcasses, they might have come off 30 different or 40 different properties with 40 different um, uh, meth or treatments of those animals. So we can, we can, in a carcass competition, we can say, yes, that's the best carcass or that's got the largest eye muscle area compared to its weight, etc. But what we're actually talking about is a combined effect of genetics and environment. So a carcass competition is not is not useful, for example, for genetic evaluation for breed plan, because I mean potentially every animal's had a different treatment. Now that questioner may not may if I haven't answered the question properly, he may need to he may like to fire another question, but. Uh, I, th I think that's the best example of what happens in a carcass competition. It's it's not useful for genetic evaluation. Thanks, Alex. Is carcass weight compared directly to other carcass weights in the contemporary group, or is it compared with previously submitted live weights? No, it's only compared with other carcass weights in the contemporary group. 
Um, and this is just a follow up to your question earlier that um, she'd love to discuss in person one day. This is the carcass competition, a um, bit hard via the written word. So I'm sure Alex will be happy too if you wanted to give him a call to discuss that. Yes, I sure would. And that's all we've got. Okay, well, um, thank you for your attendance. Good luck with picking the winner tomorrow. Um, if you're like me, you've probably got more chance in a sweep than trying to uh, um, back a horse, but anyway, good luck. Uh, and Katrina, you want to? I'll hand back to you and you can just talk about the questionnaire. Yep. Sorry everyone, I'm just getting it set up. Okay, so um, just to finish, um, when you leave the webinar tonight, there'll be some feedback. So we would really appreciate if you could take the time to fill in the questions. There's going to be three questions. So hopefully it should only take you a minute, minute or two to um, answer. And this webinar has been recorded and will be made available um, on YouTube, on the SBTS and TBTS YouTube channel tomorrow. Um, it can also be requested if anyone would like a copy of the slides, just let me or Alex know and we can send them to you. And if anyone's got um, any unanswered questions, you can contact um, the technical officer for your breed. So for Limousin and Simmental, that's Alex. For uh, Blonde, Charolais, Devon, Hereford, Murray Grey, Red Angus, Red Pole, Solaire, Shorthorn, Speckle Park, um, you can contact me. Carl Tesling is the Wagyu SBTS Technical Officer and uh, Paul from TBTS um, is happy to assist all of the tropical breeds, so Brahman, Brangus, Droughtmaster, Santa, Gertrudis, Senapol and Simbra. Um, so with that, we might end the webinar. So thanks for hopping on um, everyone and also if anyone is interested, the sixth webinar will be held on Monday. I think it's the 14th of November. Have you got a calendar there, Alex? No, but that sounds about right. Um, and it will be on genomics. So if anyone's interested in registering for that um, and you haven't already, you can register by heading to the SBTS or TBTS website and clicking on the register link. And it is the 14th of November. Thank you. All right, so we'll um, end the webinar there. Thanks, everyone.